doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor. Up next, we're joined by Hubert Dunso, the CEO of Africa Investors Group, to explore the impact of soaring public debt on financial stability and the role of development finance institutions in steering nations through economic challenges. We'll also examine strategies for recovery amidst global shocks and climate change and deploying natural assets to navigate this turbulence for sustainable growth. Thank you for joining us, Hubert. My pleasure. Glad to be here. Let's just start with looking at those countries in Africa that are highly indebted, come under the poor nations category. How is the treatment of global financial institutions at the moment of these countries in the face of all these exogenous shocks as well as their own conflicts? Yeah, no, thank you very much. That's a, that, that's a great question. And I think it really does go to the heart of the challenge that we have on the African continent. I think if you begin to look at these highly indebted uh, countries and then you begin to look at the, the, the challenges, uh, the perceived challenges that we have around accessing uh, global uh, capital markets and financial markets, uh, as well as our relationships with the multilateral development banks and institutions, that's a compounded issue. Mm. And I think that the challenge that we actually have to overcome also represents our opportunity, which is, you know, we're looking at a situation where we're starting on the premise that a broken model is capable of creating the opportunities for the future. And that is really this sort of uh, development finance, um, multilateral development bank model it, it, it is really looking at just servicing its own suite of um, instruments as opposed to really unlocking the real investment opportunity, not only for these, these countries that are highly challenged at the moment, mm -hmm. but for the entire continent. So everything tends to be categorized and classified as a financing opportunity. And I think if you begin as a journalist and, and, and as the media, you will, I, I always encourage you to just listen to how many times development institutions or, you know, will describe climate um, finance in investment terms. And I think the challenge is that everything is being sort of put in this small, narrow box with a very low ceiling called finance and climate finance, which is driving not only these highly indebted countries, but it will drive a number of us into um, some form of green multilateral development uh, finance induced debt crisis until we change the model and really understand that what, where we sit as the African continent in this time with our resources, with our opportunities, we are essentially probably one of the best multi-generational, medium to long-term investment opportunities, um, you know, uh, you know of, of, of a very long time. So I, I think we can continue to talk about, you know, how the model could potentially be optimized, but it, but it's all, it's a broken model. And I think, Patino, that's really the issue that we have. We, we, right. we posit these questions uh, in the context of how can we make a broken model better, rather than recognizing that we need to move to a very different model which enfranchises long-term investment. You know, that, that elusive $100 to $200 trillion of long-term institutional capital, when we are really continuing to play in this 1.5 collective um, balance sheet, 1.5 trillion collective balance sheet of multilateral development banks mm. that are predicated on selling risk products, even when there isn't a risk, perpetuating more perceived versus actual risk, driving up the cost of our capital. I think the fundamentals are wrong. And I think even the, the way that you pose that question tends to perpetuate that particular view. And I think we really absolutely and urgently need to see a continent that has 60% of the abundant natural capital, 40% of the key critical minerals that are going to drive a seven to $12 trillion electric vehicle market. Um, you know, more youth skills uh, and capacity in our youth world by the end of the century. We are the investment opportunity of our time. And the so problem that we have is this development model. Um, and I have to be emphatic on this point because, you know, we can't keep trying to put bandages or plasters over this gaping wound of the multilateral development finance model, even if all of these new reforms that happen, um, are, you know, that we would hope that would happen, happen, it will only close 10% of the financing gap. So we really absolutely need to con just absolutely pivot to how do we have a structured, strategic, medium to long-term um, engagement 
um, with the largest pools of pension and sovereign wealth fund and long-term institutional capital. And I think that is really the conversation I, you know, I, I would put on the table. Otherwise, Hubert, you will just continue I, to have to work with a broken model and make it just a little bit better. Hubert, with you, put it, you put it really well, Africa being in a you know, multi-generational long-term investment opportunity, certainly. And I want to delve into the global financial framework with you just after this next question. I do want to understand there is also a conversation around servicing debt with sovereign funds, sovereign wealth. Where do you stand on that and what kind of mechanisms can be adopted by creditors, by debtors in Africa to deal with that? Well, I think that what we're seeing now is the African Union have a program called the 5% Infrastructure Investment Allocation Program. And it's effectively a new compact between African pension and African sovereign wealth funds to really begin to look much more programmatically at our domestic infrastructure uh, and our cross-border infrastructure assets that could really unlock a lot more value than we're currently seeing. Mm -hmm. And then beginning to say, how can we have a strategy to be able to look at some of the past challenges and model that into the future going forward with a minimal 5% investment allocation from our institutional investors that would then crowd in much larger um, allocations from our, from our global peers and partners. And I think that that particular model is being described as a, an institutional investor public partnership. Right. And it's designed to, to crowd in more private capital at scale and see how that capital can be deployed at speed. So it's a new model, it's a new approach, and it's but, but it's much more bilateral between the institutional investors um, and, uh, and our governments as as opposed to what we had before, which was much more of a, a multilateral development bank intermediated um, arrangement, which again is part of that fundamental model, because the reality is the multilateral development banks compete with private capital. Hmm, yes. There is a reason why multilateral development banks are supposed to mobilize $10 of private capital for every $1 of finance that they provide. Now, the G20 has demonstrated and proven that for every $1 of multilateral development bank finance that they provide, they crowd in 20 to 38 cents. So, there's, so it's absolutely clear that the only way the continent can, can, can achieve our um, bankable sustainable development goals or our bankable nationally determined contribution projects, um, unlike other parts of the world that have bigger fiscuses, is through optimizing private sector participation, private capital mobilization. That is the fundamental problem. We can talk about all these different instruments mm. until the cows come home, mm. but the reality is until we unshackle ourselves from a model that is not designed to mobilize private capital at scale and give us the investment that we need, which will then give us access to the global markets for offtakes for our productive, uh, and productive goods and manufactured goods and services, we will be having this conversation for decades. And I think that's really where we need to pivot. And we've seen America pivot um, on the climate agenda through the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which mobilized in the last 12 months right. $500 billion just for climate, which is 10 times more than we on the continent have mobilized in foreign direct investment in the last 10 years. So we are developing our own as the African institutional investment community, working with African heads of state and government and ministries of finance and central banks, our own investment earth shot, which is really going to be Hubert, designed to be African equivalent. You, of, you of, just of, mentioned two, two very uh, important, very interesting things together. You mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act somewhere else, and also the fact that um, here in Africa, we are trying to access more capital and the fact that there is crowding out of private sector, some are calling it that. Um, how do you see that same kind of model being implemented, or if it is being implemented in some manner in Africa, and to ensure at the same time that this does not, uh, you know, it creates healthy competition and not the same problem in just a new face with just a new mask on? Well, we, we actually sort of describe it as a multipolarism. You've had multilateralism. Now we're in a much more bipolar, uh, uh, you know, uh, multipolar world. So we, we're describing this as multipolarism where we know what our value proposition is on the African continent, you know, our, our abundant, our superabundant natural capital. We know our critical minerals are going to be fundamental for the global transition, and we right. can put a price on that. Mm. Similarly, we can put a price on, on, on our carbon contribution, right. $4.6 trillion of carbon credit headroom between now and 2030. So, and, and so we absolutely are now beginning to value our assets. 
uh, President uh, Ruto has provided some excellent leadership um, along with uh, other heads of state in the African Union in the framework of the Nairobi Declaration. And to be honest, the Nairobi Declaration for us as institutional investors is probably more important than the Paris Agreement is to the general market. Hu Hubert, you just got back from COP28 and I don't want to run out of time and I do want your comment on this. There has been a lot of interest from oil-rich nations, developed nations in our carbon markets. How do you see that playing a role in restructuring debt and also also, of course, a catalyzing development and growth. No, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a financial asset for us. Um, and we're going to have to start pricing carbon and we're going to have to start going to the market with value propositions that we think are equitable and appropriate. And we absolutely believe that they could become very big catalyzing incentives um, to crowd in the trillions, not keep talking about the billions when we know we have $3 trillion worth of nationally determined contributions um, to address as, as, as projects. But we have, these all represent green industrialization investment opportunity. So absolutely, we're going to have to drive uh, the whole carbon conversation and really, you know, come out with an outcome that is equitable and puts the... Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.